All right, I will run this session in English because it's scheduled in English, but feel free to ask questions in Spanish. I will translate for the recording. Pueden hacer sus preguntas en español, yo traduciré para la grabación. Okay? No, no se sientan cohibidos de preguntar. Right, welcome. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm David. I work for a startup called Union.ai, um, where I wear many hats. If you work on a small company, probably you can relate. I do all things open source, and so lack of a better role name, I'm an open source technical program manager, but that's basically being a maintainer, a paid maintainer for an open source project, and also a support engineer, also a developer advocate, and many other things. So I've been working in infrastructure for about 15 years now, and um, yeah, most recently in all things Kubernetes. So uh, we'll discuss a little bit about the what, why, and how about AI and Kubernetes. And uh, so let's get started. All right, um, yeah. Okay, there you go. Cool, so what is AI? Uh, and this is a glitch in the presentation. What is AI? Is it the word of the moment, right? The buzzword of the moment, artificial intelligence. Well, uh, AI in reality is a combination of multiple disciplines. AI is concerned with uh, training, I don't know what's happening with this, yeah. Um, training machines to complete tasks that typically will require human intelligence, including uh, language and memory. But this is different to machines that think. Machines do not think. Let's be clear about this. This is mimicking or imitating human cognition in, in certain functions, but it's way different than thinking in the broader sense of the definition. That, that's artificial intelligence. A subset of AI is what we call machine learning. It's basically developing and selecting algorithms uh, to train machines to learn from a specific data set, right? To develop ways for machines to learn. And a subset of machine learning is deep learning. What is this? It's machine learning, but with multiple layers. How many layers? Well, this, is, this was inspired, the whole deep learning field was inspired by how the human brain works, where you have multiple layers of neurons uh, connected to each other. So in deep learning, you have multiple hidden layers of artificial neurons that let you, let you model uh, complex patterns in the data. That's deep learning. It's well suited for things like audio, video, and text. So that's why it's used heavily on large language models these days. Uh, but AI is great and all, but it's nothing without good data. So in my opinion, AI is also um, a reality because of data science, the unsung hero of the AI movement. And data science is all about trying to have a good data set for your model, right? The better your data set, the better your model. That's it. So you can have the, the shiniest algorithm, you can implement all the research in, in AI, but without good, a good data set, it's not very useful. So in data science, you will find different methods to ingest data, to capture data, to process this data, clean, curate, maintain, update, and store data. This is a science on its own, right? So the combination of these multiple disciplines is what we call AI. So it's, was AI invented by, by OpenAI? Oh, no. Was AI born with chat, when ChatGPT went out? Absolutely not. This is a research field more than 60 years old. So what we see today is just the culmination of decades of research, uh, but it's way more complex than chatbots. So why doing this? I mean, why causing yourself so much hurt running AI on Kubernetes? Uh, well, there are, there are some reasons here. Um, first, let's say that uh, anyone here running Kubernetes in production, maintaining Kubernetes, okay, thank you. Anyone here has used ChatGPT before or any of, okay, 
you have what it takes. So, yeah, for Kubernetes, it was designed for uh, microservices uh, or, or for applications that follow the microservices pattern, right? You have these discrete units of compute, typically stateless, meaning that this application doesn't store a state locally, doesn't persist, persist state. They just complete a task and vanish, and that's it. Even if you need to persist the state, Kubernetes has the necessary abstractions to do this. For example, the, the physical volume that you see there. Uh, it has a way to, um, is in, in a, it has these scalable ways to enable applications to share data. This is all good, it's fine. With applications that are stateless, it's very easy to do things like auto scaling, you know, automatically adding more pods to an application or scaling down is pretty easy, right? But it's not the case with AI. AI applications are way more complex than that, and I will show you why. First, because it has multiple stages. This is the typical pipeline for an AI-powered application. First of all, you will have a training phase, right? So you have your training data set. Again, it's a whole science how to retrieve this data and process the data, but you have a training data set, right? And then you have a model uh, algorithm, right, that you will use to try to detect patterns in your data set. There are even um, projects out there that let you automatically choose the best model depending on the data that you have. For example, MLflow and others, gives, or, or AutoML, sorry, AutoML is an open source project that lets you automatically pick up the best algorithm depending on your data. But let's say the, that you have training covered. You are training your model. The next thing you have to do is to graduate your model. Let, let's say your, gra your model went to school. Now the module graduates and goes out there to try to see if whatever the model learned in the training phase is useful to make predictions on data that the model hasn't seen ever, right? So it, it receives new data and the trained model should be able to make accurate predictions. So how accurate is this? It's a whole other discipline, it's model observability, how to monitor a model and see if it's making accurate, safe predictions or not, because guess what? Models will never return a 404 error, right? Errors are very different here than in regular microservices. In microservices, if the I don't know if the service is down or experiencing slow list, you will get a 503 error or 404. You, you will get an error. But here is different. The model could be completely nuts, hallucinating completely, but it won't return an error. So observability is very different. OK, that's called inference, is where you have your trained model um, with new data trying to make predictions. And then you need to make this model available to the outside world, meaning your users or another application you, for, for them to query your model. This is what we call model serving, right? An endpoint that your users or another application queries. So that's more or less the pipeline to develop an AI application. And all of this is received by a poor Kubernetes node. Why poor? How big could this be? Why large language models are called large? How large could this be? Well, here, uh, man, please. Great. Uh, here I have, uh, yeah, probably you, you don't see it really well, but it's this screenshot of the system requirements for the Llama 3.1 model, the most recent uh, model from Meta at the company behind Facebook. Uh, and this is the 405 billion parameters um, model. If you want to run it with the highest level of accuracy, you will need more than 800 gigs of GPU virtual memory per node. That is huge. That is a lot. And, it's, it, and let me remind you, it's GPU memory, even more expensive, right? Probably it won't fit into a single node. And even if it fits into a single node, it probably will be a very bad idea to build nodes this big. So you will probably want to distribute training and distribute this into multiple nodes, right? 
how hard could it be? I mean, even today you can define a deployment, a Kubernetes deployment or a replica set, and the scheduler distribute this evenly on your Kubernetes nodes, depending on available resources, and that's it. How, how hard could it be? Well, the problem is that uh, that's good for stateless apps, but these models uh, consume big chunks of data, and, uh, and there are some other challenges there. So if you have multiple nodes, like it's usually the case, you will need to, let's say, slice training into uh, different nodes. I, I slice this train in ING into different nodes, just to show you that this is, uh, each one of these is instances is not complete, right? It depends on certain process or a framework to uh, join everything so this makes sense. So you will need to distribute training uh, through multiple nodes. So most likely you will be using, <coughs> ah, and there is another problem. If you, if you define a deployment or a replica set in Kubernetes today, you just throw this at the Kubernetes scheduler and you forget about it, right? That's the whole point of Kubernetes. You don't need to deal with my pod A is running on node V and whatever. The scheduler will figure out. Uh, the thing is that if you mm, slice training, you'll need to make sure that all of these pods, let's say that each one of these is a pod, right? Each one of them needs to be scheduled and run at the same time or nothing, right? It's all or nothing. It, it, it doesn't work if it's just this, the first two pods running and the third one waiting or pending. That doesn't work. It's all or nothing. And that is not supported by the Kubernetes scheduler, to be very clear. The Kubernetes scheduler doesn't do this. This is called co-scheduling or, or gang scheduling. It's a very big problem right now in Kubernetes to do AI. So you need to engage other open source projects like Apache Unicorn or um, Volcano Scheduler, which is, by the way, a CNCF project. And they have their own way of doing gang scheduling. Because guess what? There's not a single way to do gang scheduling. There are many ways to do this. And if you want to uh, support the cluster autoscaler. Anyone here using Carpenter or cluster autoscaler or something like that? Great. You probably enjoy even the, the HPA, right? The horizontal pod autoscaler. It's a table stakes for us. If you want to do that here with gang scheduling, most of the times it's not supported. Kubernetes has a co-scheduling plugin maintained by the Kubernetes team, and it doesn't support cluster autoscaling. So it's a wild, wild west running here. OK, and the problems only get worse and worse with time. <clears throat> so, uh, you, so you will need some kind of language, not Kubernetes, some kind of language that lets you model the behavior and slice these stages into multiple nodes, whatever. Most typically, you probably are using PyTorch or KF PyTorch, the, the Kubernetes compatible implementation of, of this library to do distributed training. It's not the only one, but I'm, I'm just putting him popular names. Cool. So you, you are now doing distributed training. Okay, let's say you, you figured that out. Now you need to do distributed serving. Because if you are, if you are adopting LMs, you know, as an organization, as a company, there will be a point in your AI journey where you will probably be hosting AI models locally. Meaning, maybe today you develop a chatbot for your, your organization. You just need to, I don't know, have an OpenAI subscription, an API key, and, and query the OpenAI API, right, to get answers. But there will be a point where, where that, is not, that is not financially sustainable because it's expensive, and OpenAI is only getting more and more expensive with the time. So you will want to host and train your models locally, right? And you will want to serve this, make this available to your users. Remember that these models are large, are big, right? And at the same time, users want, uh, there are some use cases that require fast responses. For example, chatbots. It's a low latency use case of large language models. You will need to, uh, you know, give answers quickly. Probably code completion is a use case with a 
lower requirement on, on latency, but chatbots are, are pretty sensitive to latency. So you will need to, again, distribute serving in multiple nodes with all the challenges. And this is not to mention that some of the libraries require or typically use to, let's say, compress models to run on regular hardware only support CUDA, the language in the NVIDIA GPUs, right? So you will need to find a way, and, and GPUs don't behave like CPUs. I mean, you just schedule CPU capacity and release CPU capacity very easily and very quickly. GPUs are not that fast in assigning and releasing capacity. So it's a huge problem, and I, I'm not here to show you the, the solution, unfortunately. This is an unsolved problem. But I will show you a path. Very depressing intro, right? <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, for example, for serving, you will probably you will need to use an external project, external but compatible with Kubernetes, to do serving. There are things like Olama. Probably you've seen uh, projects using Olama. Olama is a model server that lets you run compressed models, I'm using the word compressed, but that's not the correct term, but reduced size models in regular hardware. Uh, but there's also KServe and other projects that let you serve uh, models on Kubernetes uh, in a more or less scalable way, okay? So this is kind of the whole picture. It's a big problem and uh, there, are, there are some ways. So <clears throat> if, if it's so hard, is anyone doing this? Is anyone doing this successfully? Well, OpenAI is doing it successfully. This is a blog post from three years ago, and there was another blog post from six years ago. So if we can make some inference, they, are, they probably right now are running about 13 to 1,500 Kubernetes nodes. All of this is running on Azure for reasons, for obvious reasons. And um, they, 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 have, they made some uh, trade-offs to be able to run at this scale. For example, they don't do distributed training. They run a pod per node, a huge pod. That, that's all on the blog post. It's public information. Yeah, a huge pod per node, and that's it. So that, that way, they don't need to auto-scale, rehydrate a model in another server, nothing like that. It's a pod per node. And, uh, and there are many other challenges, but it's, it's possible. The, the overall message is that this is possible. All right, so in summary, why AI in Kubernetes? Because, because it's flexible. That, that's the main idea. Kubernetes is, is still a good solution because it's flexible, because the ecosystem, because the, um, the way to define uh, customized logic for scheduling, for distributed resources, and of course, for the self-healing capabilities. It's unmatched. So, all right, so if you want to do this, if you're just here to learn out of curiosity, hey, how to run AI in Kubernetes, probably you won't have, you won't experience any of these problems soon. Uh, but one thing is for sure is that you will need to build a platform. Kubernetes by itself is not enough. Mm, right now, the Kubernetes community is discussing mm, some ways to make Kubernetes a better platform or at least a more native platform for AI. You can Google uh, Kubernetes serving working group. You can join the meetings. If you don't understand anything, like it's my case, you can just join, listen and learn. And, um, uh, but the reality is that Kubernetes by itself is not enough. You'll need to build a platform, meaning you will need to bring multiple integrations and develop some kind of platform with this uh, Characteristics, some things, if you see here repeatable, reliable, I mean, versioning, agile, all of that is, is nothing new, right? It's, it's pretty common in software engineering. But you will be very surprised to learn and to see how data scientists many times run big models, very mission critical models on their laptops, on a notebook, without versioning, without a way to rollback, for example. It's unbelievable, but it's true. And uh, in, in the company I work for, we support big customers running uh, heavy use cases in production, 
And uh, adopting a platform transforms completely the way they develop because they don't, most of the times, data scientists don't get the benefits that you software engineers get every day, like having versioning. That's, that's not very common in AI. So, uh, introducing Flight. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a proud maintainer of Flight. Flight is an open source project. It was donated to the Linux AI and Data Foundation in 2021. Uh, it graduated in 10 months, which is uh, amazing for an open source project. Went from uh, sandbox to graduation in 10 months. Uh, and that has to do a lot with adoption. This has been used in production by Spotify, LinkedIn, um, Toyota, Wave, the autonomous vehicle company, and many others. So uh, the idea here with Flight is that we provide, the project provides an API, a common API, that try to bridge the gap between operations and model developers. Because as you saw, there are many operational challenges in AI, but the model developers don't know and don't care about it. They just want to have a model that performs well, that is accurate, and that's it. And they want it now. And uh, so the only way we found to try to bridge the gap between these two worlds was to have a consistent API that let model developers do what they do best, write Python code to model uh, the, the steps in the development, of the development of an AI application, and let a controller translate this into uh, infrastructure artifacts, meaning Kubernetes resources and our integrations, as I plan to show you. Um, and uh, it's very easy. No, it's very easy. Why I say easy? There's nothing easy here. But uh, um, at least it's, it's straightforward to say that the contract, the idea is to make the contract very simple in terms of what the model developer needs to know and what the underlying infrastructure can provide. So things from, as a model developer, I just want to say this uh, step in the model pipeline needs to use a GPU or needs to use a specific GPU, I don't know, an NVIDIA A100 because that one supports partitioning, for example. And that's it. I, I just want to forget about the rest. Of, of how it works. And this is similar for other integrations like Ray, uh, a very popular distributed training framework, or the same PyTorch or Apache Spark and many others. How to enable uh, developers to de define this in code and letting a controller do the rest. If that sounds familiar, that's the same principle behind Kubernetes, right? How to enable develop developers in this case, using YAML, not Python, but using YAML, declare what they want and let a controller reconcile the desired state versus the observed state. That's the same thing that Flight does, but for AI applications. So with that, a live demo. What could go wrong? <clears throat> so um, yeah, let me show you real quick before I, before I run out of time. Um, all right, so what you see here, I, I'm just trying, to, I don't want to bug you with code, but I just want to show you some things. Uh, there you go. So this function here, let me use this thingy. Uh, this function here, this is, uh, this pipeline lets you leverage or use a pre-trained model, because most of the times you don't train your models from scratch unless you need it. And if, if that's the case, you will be using a foundational model, right? You use a foundational model, let's say a blueprint or a template for a model, and you train this model in your data set if you want to build a chatbot for your, the support function of your company. You train this foundational model in, in your product documentation or your knowledge base or whatever, right? To, to teach this model, hey, this is what you need to know. Right? So there are just four steps in this pipeline. It uses a pre-trained model, and it uses Olama to serve this model, and that's it. It's, in, in this case, it's a chatbot trained on a database of medical, public medical research. So you can query this model about medical questions. 
Um, so there are just four steps. First one, create a data set. <clears throat> if, you're, if you're not familiar with Python, that's fine. I'm not an expert by any means. But what this means here is that everything here in this function is native Python. And this is great news for data scientists, right? If you want to enable them to write code that actually makes it into production in a Kubernetes cluster, this is great news. I don't need to new, learn a new language, and I don't need to do many things. There are some things you need to do. First of all, you need to do this. What is that? You'll need to mm, inform uh, Flight what is the expected data type of, the, of this function. What is a data type? Integer, float, string, right? regular data types in a programming language. Uh, this is a custom data type that Flight has. This is optional. If you're, anyone here writes Python code or familiar with Python, yeah. Probably, as you will probably know, this is optional. If you're a Python de developer, you don't need to do this because the, the Python engine knows. It will detect what is the output type, if it's a string, a float, whatever. But here is mandatory. And the reason for this is because many times when in the training phases of your AI model, they will, they, you will transform your data so much that sometimes, for example, a float and ends up becoming an integer, or a string ends up becoming a list or an array, right? And these mismatches between what the function A uh, returns and what the function B expects typically are only detected at runtime when the model is running. And it, that's expensive, right? So what Flight does is to obligate you to type this so you so the the engine can detect type is matches at compile time, saving you time and resources. This is probably this is very normal for us software engineers if there's a mismatch in a variable. This is, this is detected by the compiler. Pretty easy, but this is not the case in data science. Believe me, these guys are struggling a lot. So that's the, 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 the first step. Second step. <clears throat> We'll do something that is called fine tuning. Anyone here has heard about fine tuning, large language model? Right, thank you. Fine tuning is nothing more than just taking a foundational model, but training it in a specific data set, showing this model how to do certain things, right? This is fine tuning. There are, there are some other uh, methods to do this more efficiently, like RAG, retrieve augmented generation, et cetera. But this is fine tuning. So we will take an Olama model, right? And we will uh, train this model into the data set that we just created. We created the data set. In the first step, it just went through the PubMed data set and, uh, or database, and it created a data set out of it. And in the second step, it will fine tune um, the, um, the model. Third step. This is a hack, but it says a lot, right? LoRa to GigOff. Anyone has heard about LoRa? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. This is a kind of new technique to compress models. The word, the term is quantize, quantize models, right? But to me, it's very similar to compression, meaning if you have a model with more than 400 billion parameters, which is so huge, what if you can have an algorithm that looks through the parameters and removes some of them that are not that relevant? It will reduce the accuracy of the model a bit. You need to make a trade-off on accuracy, similar to what you do if you compress music, right? MP3, what, what is MP3? It's an audio compression technology. It, it removes uh, beats from frequencies that you cannot hear anyways and makes a smaller file. So, LoRa and GigOff are um, files or file formats that the first is an algorithm and the second is a file format that in summary makes the model much smaller and much more capable, or capable of running in regular hardware. Well, not super regular because here it requires an accelerator. This is something that is particular to flight. 
It, it gives you as a model developer the ability to specify if you need an accelerator. Accelerator is a GPU typically, or a TPU. In this case, it's requesting an NVIDIA Tesla T4, and this is the only thing as a developer that you need to do to consume a GPU. Obviously, someone in operations has to make sure that your infrastructure actually has access to GPUs. But from the developer point of view, it's only this. And uh, the last point is to do serving, right? It will query the OpenAI um, API, and it will return the responses, and this is the, this is the prompt. This is the question to the model. And uh, I'm running this on a yeah, flat serverless instance. Uh, by serverless, this is a big flight cluster. And uh, ev every one of these four steps that I show you is a Kubernetes pod, right? So the code that you saw there, it's executed inside a pod, right? And the outputs are returned. That's it. You, and um, the way to model this is using a, a DAG uh, that understand the dependencies, the outputs, the inputs, et cetera, and it brings you the, the available model. Let me see if this is running. Um, yeah, I can show you this one. It's a slightly different one where you can have the output here, and uh, I ask it, the model, to only respond in rhymes. How are you? And, uh, well, this is the answer in rhymes. So not super surprising. I mean, you can do the same thing in 10 seconds, right? Without all this stuff, right? But to be able to do this scalably on Kubernetes, you will need, you will need uh, to create a platform. So in summary, just to recap, um, there's a big problem. AI workflows uh, or workloads are super dynamic. Because the, the moment you detect that your model is hallucinating, you will need to go back to school, go back to training phase. And uh, some of these phases handle large objects, which make it more complicated. Development could outsize a, signal no a single node many times. And uh, in summary, you will need to build a platform. I run out of time. Any question? Alguna pregunta? Uh, supongo que eso significa que entendieron mucho o nada, este, pero bueno, creo que sí, dale. No, todo lo que viste es gratis, o sea, gratis. Es open source, que no es gratis. Eh, todo lo que viste allí, lo único que es, digamos, diferente es donde yo corrí el modelo, uh, que es esta instancia serverless. Esta es un servicio pago. ¿Por qué lo hice ahí? Porque es mucho más rápido. Es decir, el clúster de flight ya está creado. Yo simplemente, y, y todo está, todo usa caching. ¿sí? Así que, pues, me permite hacerlo mucho más rápido. Pero si lo quieres hacer open source, puedes montar el clúster flight en tu laptop, en, en Minikube, en GKE, XS, AWS y OCI, todos esos son soportados. Um, cualquier distribución de Kubernetes, lo único que necesitamos de Kubernetes es el API server, nada más. Uh, la pregunta es si el, si el modelo se puede exportar para otra parte. Cuando haces serving, digamos que ya has exportado un binario, ¿sí? para usar términos de la ingeniería, has exportado un binario que se puede transportar y se puede consultar en cualquier lugar. ¿sí? Si se puede portar a otro sistema, claro, porque todo lo que está dentro de la función sigue siendo Python. Así que lo único que cambia es estas anotaciones que están al comienzo, que es at task, y le puedo decir, por ejemplo, la imagen. No hay que escribir Docker files. Él construye la imagen por sí mismo. El template del acelerador, todo lo demás. Pero lo de adentro es Python. Sí. 
Sí, sí, de hecho es, y es que se me quedó ahí corriendo, pero la, el, la última, el último paso de la, del pipeline, y cuando lo invoco aquí, lo que me entrega es el, el Gigo file, digamos el archivo ya del modelo entrenado, se le dieron unos queries, que es más que todo por fines demostrativos, pero de ahí en adelante puede hacer cualquier query eh, que necesites. Ajá, ajá, tal cual, así es. Dale, gracias. Da. En un ámbito, la, funciona, la, la finalidad de la, de la función del fine tuning es para enmarcarlo pues, en, un, en un scope exclusivo. Sí, sí, exacto, porque estos modelos de los fundacionales como Lama, como muchos de ellos, eh, digamos han sido entrenados en un corpus de información importante pero probablemente no sepan nada de tu producto si por ejemplo estás haciendo un chatbot de tu producto o no sepan nada específicamente de un campo de medicina en el que necesitas dar respuestas a usuarios, etc. Eso es fine tuning, tomar la base de un modelo no entrenarlo de cero, que se puede hacer pero requiere mucho más recurso y tiempo tomarlo de cero y entrenarlo y por eso es muy popular esa técnica te lleva mucho más rápido a un producto eh, basada en inteligencia artificial. Uh -huh. oh. Sí, aquí creo que está resumido mejor eh, con respecto a lo que hace Union AI. Es un, es un Kubernetes, pero para cargas de ML. Ah, okay. ¿De dónde saca plata si todo es open source? Bueno, hay, una, hay un servicio, esto es open core. ¿sí? Todo lo que vieron es open source, el producto pago les da además la gestión de la infraestructura, si así lo necesitan, y les da otras funciones más avanzadas como Data Lineage, Artifacts, la posibilidad oh. de, de una respuesta de un modelo devolverse al dato que la produjo, lo cual es muy complicado de hacer. O sea, en, un, en una ingeniería de software, pues es muy fácil coger el SHA de, en Git y devolverse, saber un build, qué código lo produjo. Eso en Data Science no, o sea, no pasa. También, no o sea, pasa. también gestiona el Entonces, clúster de cada... Dime. O sea, también gestiona el clúster donde montas las cargas. Eso es uno de los servicios. Ustedes pueden traer su clúster o, o hay servicios también de que le gestiona el clúster. Sí, sí. Uh -huh. okay. uh, bueno, eh, estoy trabajando ahorita en un proyecto con Stratio, pero Stratio sí, pues bueno, no, no tiene la funcionalidad de manejar el clúster completo, sino como solo gestionar pues, las cargas de IA. Entonces, eh, o sea, bueno, gestionar la, la interfaz de comunicación de la, del, del, del IA. Entonces, eh, sí, esto hace más. Entonces, o sea, gestiona el clúster adicionalmente. Uh -huh, así okay. es. Dale. Gracias a todos. Voy a estar acá si quieren discutir algo. Gracias. Gracias.